Good morning, everyone. We have a lively audience here today. That's great. Today is Tuesday, November 29th, and welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting. And we're going to start today with the flag salute led by Supervisor Holmes. of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all, and welcome to those of you here in the chambers with us and those on Zoom. Uh, our first item is our consent agenda. And uh, I do believe we want to pull a couple of items. Uh, Supervisor Jones, did you? Yes, I would like to pull item 22A. OK. And Supervisor Wygant? I'd like to pull 20B. Thank you very much. Any other items, board members? Any other items to be pulled? OK. Are there any public comments on our consent calendar? Any items you wish to address? Good morning. Uh, there are three items on the consent calendar. Uh, let's see, they are 16A, 18A, and 21B. 16, 18, and 21B. 18A, I'm sorry, 16A, 618A? Well, 16, I guess, A and B. Each one, okay. I guess, is A and B. Okay, 16. 18, A and B, and then 21B, actually, 21, I think it is. Yes, I think he said both 18A and B, 16A and B, and 21B. Am okay. I correct on that? No, it's just 16B, oh. pardon me, and 18A, 18. only 18A, and then 21 is B. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public wishing to address consent calendar items? Okay, then I would accept a motion to approve everything other than 16B, 18A, 21B, 22A, I'm sorry, and 20B. I'll move approval of the consent agenda. Okay, okay. Motion, motion and second on those remaining items. And this is a roll call. Gore? Aye. White, yeah. yeah. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Okay, we'll start in order, 16B, Mr. Garabedian. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid I have a lot of trouble understanding what this item is for. Um, for, uh, for the state of California, I reviewed agricultural conservation easements for four and a half years. They were funded by the state, and I went to four of the Land Trust Alliance trainings for people who do that and work on impl implementing conservation easements. Um, now, the, the description on the agenda really doesn't tell you much except there's a money allocation. It doesn't say what it's for, and um, so it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, it looks like this is part of a program where the consultant is proposed to spend $8 million over 10 years. We've already, this county's already spent a couple million, two, two or three million. And this is another million, and then there's another number of years where it'll, where it'll add up to, um, uh, I guess, that eight million, something like that. And the question is, what is it for? It, it, it's not for an easement. Apparently, they're planning to submit the county, a conservation easement to the county, but it's not attached to this. So they're not doing the easement at this time. And apparently, they may be planning to run a, um, an in-lieu fee program. So. Besides the money that the county has been giving them and keep, keep giving them, there will be people who want to develop, I guess, who will pay in lieu fees. It's not clear if that, if that relates to this or not. So I just, even though I'm pretty well informed about this area, I found it really hard to say 
tell what it's for. And this particular allocation of one to two million is just part of a larger package that uh, is according to that agreement. So, boy, it would sure be helpful to have some understanding here. Okay. And, I, well, and I know that to get understanding, if you go to the if you go to the off go to the mm -hmm. the windows at Cedra, uh, they tell you to call somebody, though I haven't, I just saw this tonight, so I didn't have I Well, have I do it. believe Greg McKenzie is online and he will address your questions. Did you have any other questions before you sit down? No, I'm not on this item. Okay, Thank so you. um, you'll take a seat, Greg will answer I'll those, take address those issues. And then we'll bring you back up for the next item. Hi, Greg. Or I'm sorry, is there any other public comment on this item before Greg starts to <laughs> delve into this? I'm not seeing any here. I see none on not Zoom. on Zoom. Okay, Greg, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen, Greg McKenzie, your PCP administrator here this morning with, uh, it's a budget amendment. Uh, this project, the Markham Ravine in the fee mitigation site was approved under a contract by the board back in 2019. Uh, it did include as per item, a conservation easement. That conservation easement was subsequently recorded over the 297-acre site. I believe that was in September of 2020. Um, and so this part of the contract is for the fulfillment of mitigation credits that were constructed on that 300-acre site. So approximately 50 acres of wetland credits have been constructed on that site. And as we collect fees under the Plaster County Conservation Program fee program, we then fulfill those credits by uh, basically paying for those from our contractor who constructed those mitigation credits and continue to carry those and to ensure that they meet performance requirements of all the state and federal agencies. So this is a simple budget amendment. We've collected these fees. We need to now transfer these fees to Westfield Ecological Services in fulfillment of the credit contract. So if you have questions, happy to answer those. Thank you very much, Greg. Are there any questions? Robert, I see your light on. Yeah, just <clears throat> we'll add uh, from a policy perspective, I think might be useful. I, I'm guessing that Michael and I just disagree on whether this is good or bad policy, and that's fine. Uh, but we're in the early implementation phase of the Placid County Conservation Plan. And um, it was a project that was 20 years in the making with hundreds, I'm sure thousands of hours of public discourse. Um, it includes um, a, a unprecedented comprehensive uh, program uh, in the nation for uh, really good conservation and streamlining of development. Part of our responsibility includes the issue that's uh, involved in this particular consent agenda item, which is a requirement to have um, an inventory of uh, vernal pool properties, we call it the stay head inventory, part of the negotiations with the regulatory agencies. So the county is and the conservation authority is investing in, in these stay ahead um, properties uh, so that we have an inventory of open space as we do this permitting because it's more conservative <coughs> conservation approach. And uh, Greg and his staff out at the authority have done a remarkable job of finding and acquiring properties the uh, conservation authority is sort of separating and weaning itself from the county's umbrella, and that's going to take some time. Uh, the county has been gracious in funding a lot of that effort. Uh, but on the other hand, we've also permitted some extremely exciting economic development projects through that system also. So personally, I think it's a great story, and of course, Greg has gotten well into the technical weeds as it relates to the question itself, but it's a budget agenda item. Uh, a budget amendment item simply because the county's been uh, funding a lot of our work as we go forward that includes an in lieu fee and the stay ahead requirement uh, but for the public I think it's well worth uh, trying to describe that thank you Robert uh, board members any other comments or questions on this item I have none. and with that I'll move approval of the item second. I'll take uh, supervisor Wygant second <laughs> And is this a roll call? Yes, it this is. item? Yes. Mm -hmm. Gore? Aye. Do I get? Yep. Holmes? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Now we'll move on to item 18A. Mr. Garabedian, did you want to 
ask your questions about item 18A. This is found on page 253 of our board packet. Uh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to flag this uh, partly for my interest in the question of uh, electromagnetic uh, 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 tower uh, that affects people. It, I think it's really important. We, I've discussed this issue a bit before, but I think it's very important. What I haven't mentioned before is that some people have hypersensitivity to ele electromagnetic frequencies. And I don't know if it's predictable what happens, but I think it's very important to understand that, that, that some people may be affected in their everyday life, others may be affected if they're vulnerable or aged or home from the hospital or things like that. So I know there are federal rules affecting this, but um, I think it's really important. Other people have talked to here about EMF, and I think it's important to add to that discussion about the highly sensitivity that some people have. I did attend, I may have mentioned before, the, the first medical legal medical conference on EMF that was in Santa Cruz about four years ago. And there's a lot to be learned about this issue. Thank you, Mr. Garabedian. Is there anyone from staff that uh, would like to address this item? Good morning. <coughs> Paul Breckenridge, Deputy Director for Facilities Management. And, um, you know, typically we've got uh, lots of cell uh, locations throughout the county that we uh, lease and uh, to others, and uh, we typically don't have a, uh, an approach to looking at EMF uh, throughout uh, for each of these sites. We haven't run into any issues up to this point. Um, so, you know, at this point, you know, it's kind of a standard operating procedure. We don't, haven't looked into studying EMF at, at those locations. Great. Thank you. May I, I know the FCC... Um, <coughs> is completely in charge of this item, and we at local agencies can't deny these for those reasons. Um, and just to clarify, Paul, this is an existing site, correct? Existing site that we're just—it's a renewal, and we're we're happy to. It, ser it serves a lot of our uh, county communications, and uh, we're pleased that we're able to get it redo. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comments on this item? Not seeing any. Uh, any other board questions on this item? I'd entertain a motion. Wygant and Gore. Again, is this a roll? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we'll move on then to item uh, 20B. We're going to go to 20B first, Mr. Garabedian, and we'll come back to 21B. I Mr. Just, Garabedian? Uh, oh, thank you. The, this Oops. is a different item. Uh, this isn't one you pulled, it was uh, pulled by Supervisor Wygant. So this item is the appointment of our new uh, county exec, Jane Christensen, and I thought being on consent was really kind of not appropriate. Uh, so Jane is the seventh county exec that I've worked with in my 28 years, and Lucky I just seven. want... <laughs> Lucky number seven. <laughs> Lucky number seven. And um, I just wanted to congratulate her uh, publicly. I wanted the public to know that the board did a comprehensive uh, broad-based search uh, we had a great cluster of uh, people uh, to interview. Uh, the second interviews I wanted to highlight were all internal candidates, people who are here uh, in Paso County, and I think all exemplary. Uh, but Jane, I think, has a unique set of uh, skills and traits that will serve us extremely well. As I look to my retirement, I know the county is going to be well served with her uh, leadership in the county exec's office, so I just wanted to make that. Thank you, Robert. Bonnie? And Robert, I appreciate you pulling the items so we can discuss, and I too am very pleased with the decision of our board to move up ahead with Jane Christensen as our new CEO, and she's acted in that capacity now for five to six months and, and really done an excellent job, and I really appreciate her willingness to communicate uh, with staff, to hear from um, internal um, folks as well as our external partners, and um, I'm really excited to have her as our CEO, and I, I do agree. We have some great, we had some great internal candidates, um, and we've got great leadership um, coming up as well. But it's it's wonderful that we were able to uh, move Jane into this role. And I, well, we can have other comments, but I'm happy to move approval of the item after you take public comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just, uh, I would also like to echo those comments and and comment that I also want to thank all the panelists and support staff and county staff that participated, both external and internal to the county, 
in this selection process and our fellow electeds that served on the panel, I think we had a broad base of, and the board so appreciates the wisdom uh, and communication from so many of our staff that will be working with and for Jane in this capacity. I think it's really important to the constituents to understand the thoroughness of that process and uh, how united we were in our support for uh, your appointment, Jane. And so, um, and you wanted to say something before public comment or do, can I entertain, okay. So with that, um, not seeing any other board members, so are there public comments on this item? Not seeing any, so Jane, you wanted to, before we make a motion or after? After. Okay, <laughs> so I'll accept a motion, do I? I'll second the motion. Uh, we'll have a second, that was why. Make uh, sure they vote yes. Gordon Wygant, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions, okay. And there's a new nameplate appearing with that action. Well, thank you to the board uh, for all of your kind comments and uh, to all that participated and served in the recruitment process. Um, as I commented throughout the interviews, it was a five-month interview, which was quite, quite the gauntlet, but um, I'm honored to serve in this capacity. Like many on the board, I come from a long tradition of public service in my family. And uh, there's a quote that my father always used to say that I think captures the moment um, from President Theodore Roosevelt. It says, far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to serve Placer County in this capacity. Thank you. Well said, Jane. Okay. Then we'll move back to item 21B. And Mr. Garabedian, you asked to, to have this item pulled. Thank you, Mike Garabedian. Uh, the, I don't know if you can, but uh, the uh, part of this you are uh, authorizing destruction of records received under non-disclosure agreements. And I just wondered if it's possible for you to give some clarification about what that means and what that uh, has to do with. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have staff? Okay. Jarrett, do you want do you want to address this item? Uh, I'm sorry, are there any other public comments on this item before? Okay. Jarrett, would you address the question? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so the purpose of this um, NDA is really being driven by uh, service standards, by the way. Uh, let me address you properly uh, to our guests and members of the board, Jared Thiessen, Placer County uh, CIO. Uh, so the, the, the reason why we're creating this NDA is to um, basically hold, um, you know, our, our uh, internet service providers uh, to service standards. Um, and it's really being driven by service standards. And so we, we want the ability and we need the ability uh, to share uh, data uh, back and forth between uh, the county and those internet service providers, specific data uh, to their performance and how they're performing. And, and, and to be able to do that, uh, we really need um, an NDA uh, in place. Um, the, uh, in terms of uh, you know, destruction of, of records received. Um, I believe the government code that's referenced there is that, you know, we need to retain, um, you know, records for a certain period of time. And then at the end of that uh, period of time, you know, to, to destroy the records. So, um, you know, it really uh, serves both the county and the internet service provider, um, you know, that, that we're not retaining records beyond uh, their, their useful period and beyond what we're required to do. Um, I think Maggie's in the room, so I don't know if Maggie wants to uh, add to that uh, at all about the government code specifically. Yeah. Good morning, Board of Supervisors, CEO Christensen. Um, Jared is absolutely right. So this is driven by the broadband service standards. We would like the ability to receive certain materials from internet service providers um, and then destroy those um, in time periods less than the standard periods provided in the government code. We are allowed to destroy those um, upon the determination of the CIO under the government code, and that's the, the site that we have um, cited in the memo. And so this is simply allowing us to exchange the information with inf uh, internet service providers and then destroy it um, when we're finished using it. 
Thank you, Maggie, for the clarification. And Jarrett, are there any questions, board members? I'm not seeing any, so I would entertain a motion. I'm going to go with Holmes and Gore on that one, although you guys are giving me a fast pace this morning. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And then on to item 22A, Supervisor Jones. You had some questions on this? Good morning. Um, I, and um, Andy Fisher is here to present this one. Um, I just needed a little bit more clarification. I've been working with the um, Little League folks and Feist Park, and so just need some clarification on what all of this means. Certainly. <laughs> Good morning to each of you, and hearty congratulations to our new CEO. Um, so this is a two-part item before you this morning, and the request is to approve use, uh, use and maintenance agreement, one, specifically with uh, Eureka, Loomis Eureka Lakeside Little League, um, and the other is to approve a very similar template that could be applied to other leagues. Uh, the youth leagues in our community provide an invaluable partnership to us. They effectively run a lot of the rec programming that happens within an unincorporated Placer County. Uh, they've become partners with us. They do a lot of volunteer work. Um, and we have rented uh, fields to them all the way from the Tahoe area to Granite Bay and West Placer for years and years. But what's not been codified over time is what that rental um, entitles you to, what the roles and responsibilities and mutual expectations are. Um, and so over time, as some of those, uh, the partnerships have become more and more complex, they do more and more volunteer work, bring more and more equipment onto our fields, things like that. Uh, it just, the time became ripe and mutual to everyone's interest to codify those agreements. Uh, might have been fine if it was just a few of us in the office talking to a few on the board and everything was understood, but those leagues have armies of coaches out there, we have staff out there, and there was just some missing clarity. And so that's what these agreements are. Um, they touch on areas, um, for example, what does your rental agreement entitle you to? Because some of these leagues have fundraiser events, festivals, things like that, along with the, the play, the, the regular league play and tournaments that they have. When does that rise to a level that we need to require additional sanitation, uh, food trucks that require environmental health oversight, you know, all sorts of things like that. It touches on um, the use of sponsorship signage, when you bring equipment on, who owns it, when it needs to be removed, how it's stored, just all of those practical concerns. Lakeside Little League is one of the largest leagues that we deal with and we have some kind of the most complex arrangement with them. They, they utilize our snack bars, things like that. So they were a natural first one to work through this agreement with. And then we'd also like to be able to, to enter into similar agreements with our other large leagues. The intent is not that this would apply to somebody who just wants to do a pickup game on a Sunday as part of a birthday party or something like that. These are really for the leagues that rent seasonally from us. So Andy, do they pay an amount for this? They do, and we will be, we've been working through a, um, a fee increase agreement that we, uh, uh, the, the schedule is codified in our county recreation ordinance. We do expect to return to your board in January with an update to those fees because they're very, very low. They've not been updated in over 20 years. This agreement in itself does not affect the fee, the rate that they pay. Mm -hmm. uh, it does require a security um, deposit though for any direct damage repair. Okay, and then also the last thing is how much um, are they required to maintain in this, in this agreement? Um, in this particular, um, well, let me make sure I understand. That. Well, what is the, it says maintenance, um, a maintenance agreement. So are yeah. they required to maintain? Uh, required usually is an offering. We don't okay. um, put it on them per se, but some of them like to have that uh, option to come on and drag the fields, the infields before they play, to water the infields, to keep the dust down. So it's not necessarily compulsory maintenance, but it's the things they want to do. Okay, so that the dragging of the fields wasn't something as a requirement in the contract? No. Okay, and then um, is the batting cage part of their agreement? Uh, the batting cage, we have one batting cage in our entire inventory, and right now it is out of service. Um, this agreement allows for use of it if it ever comes back into service, but the future of that batting cage is still to be determined. So, so did the county pay for the batting cage or did the Little League pay for the batting cage? I believe it was a combination. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So will they be 
in the future, is there a possibility of working out something where the county and the Little League build a new batting cage at a different location? Lots of different ideas on the table that are working their way through what is the most practical outcome, but we do have our eye on it. We do know that it's an amenity that the leagues use and value down there. Okay. So. Great. So when will we know how much is there going to be a dollar amount this part of this contract? Uh, no, only a security deposit. Just so there's not a payment, uh, but that will be coming forward to you uh, okay. across the board uh, update to our, to our fees that we charge okay. for use of fields. That should be coming in January. Great, thank you. Thank you, Andy, appreciate it. Great, are there any other questions, board members? Is there any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any. Um, would you like to make a motion? Yes, I approve. Supervisor Jones and Wygant, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Andy. Okay. That concludes, I believe, our consent calendar. If I got all my items correct, that was a busy consent calendar. Uh, we'll move then to public comment. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address us on items not on today's agenda. Uh, please limit your comments to three minutes and understand the board cannot take action today. Yes, good morning. Good morning, I'm Skip Myers, a resident of, <coughs> excuse me, Placer County and also a member of the uh, state of New California. And I'm uh, addressing the board uh, with the notice of the Declaration of Truth number 10. I'll move through some preliminaries. The people of California are suffering from a tyrannical state government which fails to provide a Republican form of governance, enables and supports across its southern border the invasion of the United States of America by illegal foreign nationals, and protects vicious criminals who commit outrageous acts of violence upon the citizens of America, all caused by a government of and for a monoparty system led by a tyrannical pusillanimous dictator who openly defies federal law. Uh, California state violates uh, U.S. Constitution, Article 4, Section 4, uh, Article 6, the First Amendment, and the 14th Amendment. That's a lot. We the people say that the servants are to serve. The state of California is in constitutional default and does not have constitutional standing as a member state in the union of states called the United States of America. We the people as citizens of the United States living in California are following the process of West Virginia, which successfully restored the Virginia state government after the Wheeling Conventions of 1861. Congress admitted California into the Compact of Statehood within the United States of America in 1850 uh, because their 1849 Constitution, ratified for consideration, guaranteed a Republican form of government. The exclusion of we the people from the legislature and the legislative process in California has long been one of concern to Californians. As each year goes by, the overbalance of the bureaucracies influence all elements of the legislative process and has created a bureaucratic state that's drowned out the voices of the very we the people. Perhaps no better explanation for the exclusion of the people from one of the people's servants who has witnessed the exclusionary process intensified to the point where the people are all but forgotten. Uh, California State Senator Jim Nielsen, a Republican from Red Bluff, departs the legislature because of term limits at the end of this term. Senator Nielsen reflected on his years in the California legislature, which spanned from 1978 to 2022 in a recent article from the Epoch Times. Thank and you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Skip. Appreciate your comments, yes, I'm sure. Good morning, Richard. Good morning. My name is Richard Lingenjo, L-I-N-G-E-N-S-J-O. 
Um, I received, along with my uh, bill uh, for my electric service, uh, a bill insert from PG&E, and I would ask the chair lady's permission to pass this to the, uh, there's copy here for every one of the board members and the staff. And um, I'm, not, I'm not aware that people realize that in PG&E's service area, and, and this document is October 22, and, and I received it with my current billing. And 39% um, of PG&E power is nuclear, according to PG&E. And it's uh, recognized as greenhouse gas free in a renewable resource by the agency or by the, by the company. Um, SB 846 in recent time uh, for uh, recognized Diablo Canyon power plant and it uh, will remain operational under that legislation to 2030. Because as everyone might imagine, if we suddenly lose 39% of our electrical power, the damn state will come to a screeching halt. Uh, the, uh, my company uh, does not, well actually, we will reject any government direct government funding. So I'm not looking for any funding. What I'm looking for is uh, uh, encourage the Board of Supervisors to officially accept my endeavor, to, which is inevitable, uh, to produce electrical power in the state using molten salt reactors, which are safe and clean, as opposed to the current dangerous water-cooled reactors. So it's safe and clean power. It's inevitable. Let's get started. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Doug Wells. I'm from Rockland, and I will be continuing to read from the Tenth Declaration of Truth. I represent New California, and I have sent all previous nine to each one of you in email, and I'll be sending this one as well, so you get a chance to read it. So Skip was mentioning that uh, Nielsen, Senator Nielsen, had an interview from Epic Times, and I have a few of the uh, quotes or something that he said during that interview. In 2010, Proposition 25 uh, was passed, and that meant that the Republican minority was largely frozen out of the legislative process. Uh, reading further down, uh, the atmosphere has changed since 2010, with Republican uh, representation dropping down to a super minority uh, in status in 2018. Um, if th this represents an erosion of representation for we the people. Um, if government is going to operate as a dictatorship, it is not good for the people. Nielsen says, in quote, uh, the worst problem of all is not that we are uh, doing, not, is not that they are doing with the Republicans, but what, that they are cutting out the public. And Nielsen went on to say that uh, the new budget process gives the Democrat leaders uh, and the governor too much power. But this is done deliberately in his words. Um, why don't the Democrats want to run a legislative uh, protest against the COVID emergency, for instance? It is because it is convenient for them. Uh, there's always been an ongoing emergency in effect because it is convenient for the governor. Democrats uh, don't, see, don't, don't seem to care. They don't complain about it. They just say, okay. Well, Nielsen has put in bills that have forced a termination of uh, criteria 
of extra, uh, say, type A2, excuse me, forced uh, termination criteria external to the legislative branch. They couldn't just unilaterally decide to do the uh, legislation, um, but what Nielsen has done is to put limits, it's a 60-day, a 70-day um, um, limit on a, an emergency order. So um, again, this is more convenient for the uh, government and more centered, uh, the, the more centers the power and takes the power away from the people. Sorry that I don't have more time. I will send this to you by email and you can read it at your leisure. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Doug. Are there any others in the audience here that would like to address the board? Uh, Mike Garabedi, and I guess I'm trying to speak to every item that's come up in a row. Uh, I, I don't want to comment on the last comment, but I do want to say that California and the country has a problem with rural America being redistricted and reapportioned off the map. And, but it's, a, it's something that both parties are involved in because the members like to have safe seats and we really should have more competitive seats. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garabedian. Do we have any public commenters online, Megan? I see that, yeah. Okay, then we will close our public comment. Thank you for your comments this morning. Uh, we'll move on to board member and county executive reports. Jim, you have your light yes, up. I, uh, yes, um, Holmes. you know, we drive into this building at least twice a day, twice a week. Uh, I, I'm here all the time, and uh, sometimes the landscape changes. And I don't know how many have noticed the improvements to the Y statue out uh, on our entrance. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, make reference to uh, Andy Fisher's team uh, with uh, Matt Williams was the supervising, uh, uh, working on that. They pulled out some old growth junipers that were due to come out. They've been there since the 70s. Um, replace them with some Jack, uh, Japanese box words, box words and uh, planted a heritage rose uh, to complement the one that was on the other side and they repaired the fountain. Uh, so they worked tirelessly to get that done before Veterans Day. And I just wanted to uh, thank Andy and his team. Uh, among them were uh, Jamie Denardi, Tim Mathern, Brant Holston, Carlos Ortiz, Ortiz and uh, Pete Van Cliff. They did an exceptional, exceptional job for a, something that needed to be done for many years. So just wanted to give them some thanks and uh, a shout out to them for the good job they did. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Jones. Yes, I wanted to mention to everybody about the Placer uh, Business Alliance had a conference in DC um, the week before last and Supervisor Holmes, Chair Gustafson, and I attended. And it was a very good program um, on economic development that also included a lot about our forest management here in uh, Placer County and other surrounding areas. So uh, kudos to Cherry Spriggs. I thought she did an excellent uh, job of putting it all together. Very informative and a very productive meeting that we had. And just wanted to thank Placer Business Alliance. Thank you. Supervisor Gore. Thank you, and I wanted to report out that I had the opportunity to attend the annual California State Association of Counties meeting uh, in Southern California uh, two weeks ago. And currently I serve as the co-chair of the Housing and Land Use and Transportation Committee, and one of our panelists was Dan Heldridge, uh, we, um, who is with Housing Trust Placer. And so we had a couple of representatives from a couple of different counties talking about creative housing solutions, different ways different counties are looking to address uh, the housing crisis in each of our communities. And so it was terrific to have Dan there, and it looks like we're making some progress on perhaps the first housing trust plaster project um, coming hopefully soon. Uh, but it was terrific to be able to showcase Plaster County and the work we're doing here, which um, is certainly creative with this private-public partnership and trying to leverage grant dollars, um, <coughs> county dollars, and, and private dollars. So it was really nice to be able to, uh, to share the work we're doing here in Plaster County. Thank you. I'm not seeing a report. Um, I have a quick, two quick reports. One is I did attend um, the governor's 
uh, task force meeting with the chairs of all of the uh, counties as well as uh, city uh, leadership throughout the state um, to talk about homelessness. And in the meeting uh, that we were all called to, the, you know, the governor had held back some of the funding that was going to be made available. Um, and he made it very clear, as well as his staff, uh, that they want to see more progress uh, on homelessness. And I think all of those of us in the audience with him agreed that we all want to see more progress on homelessness, but what are the solutions? And so there was a lot of testimony, primarily from the larger cities and counties, uh, relative um, to what they wanted to see. Some wanted more mandates from the state. Um, but I don't think that was shared by the smaller jurisdictions. Uh, but what we all, uh, what most uh, agreed to in the room uh, was we want dedicated funding from the state to address this issue. Uh, we do want to be rewarded for innovation. Um, we want to see more funding for Project Home Key. Uh, and then there was a number of examples shared by the various jurisdictions on what's working, what isn't working. Uh, and um, so I, I'm hopeful, I know our staff were online and listening to the testimony provided and that we can follow up on some of those best practices. We are very fortunate here in Placer County that while we do have homeless in our communities, our numbers are relatively low uh, and the lowest in the Northern California region. So um, we have a dedicated staff working on it and what we've done with our Project Home Key funds has addressed some of it uh, and uh, continuing with great work from our Health and Human Services Department and our faith-based organizations addressing uh, homelessness here. So um, there's not much more to report other than it was a um, press conference after that I think was the main target of most of the, the work that we were there for. Um, and then the second item, uh, similar to Supervisor Holmes, I wanted to thank, um, and for those of you who don't know, when you're set up here uh, in the county seat, you get a whole variety of things you're asked to uh, address and solve, one of which was an abandoned boat in Lake Tahoe. And we had been uh, addressing this concern for at least seven months through the state water board. And when we finally asked our sheriff, what could we do? Within two weeks, our sheriff's department got that boat out of the water and and it was not an easy task, but we, um, I can't thank, and I don't have all the names of everybody who worked on it, but I just so appreciate that um, we serve the public in many ways that we're not always used to dealing with. Um, everybody pointed their fingers at whose responsibility is an abandoned boat, but our sheriff's department got the boat out. So thank you uh, again, Wayne, and all of your staff for uh, making that happen. and getting that out of the water of Lake Tahoe. So with that, we can move on to our first timed item. We're only 15 minutes late for you. Um, and this is a presentation um, from the Placer County Office of Education uh, on the Williams Schools in Placer County. And we are so honored to have Gail Garbolino here with us today. Good morning, members of the board of supervisors. Gail Garbolino Mojica, Placer County Superintendent of Schools, and I am here for my 16th year of presenting to you the Williams Schools in Placer County. Um, the last couple of years, we were looking at the same schools, uh, I think for about six years in a row, uh, due to some glitches with the education code. Um, and so those glitches have since been fixed, um, and we are now um, here to report more accurate information to you uh, on the uh, five Williams schools that we have here in Placer County. I am going to turn it over to my assistant superintendent of educational services, Jennifer Hicks, who's much more of an expert on this particular topic than I am, and she's going to walk you through the presentation. Thank you. Good morning. 
So as Gail mentioned, statute was updated and became effective in January of 2022 that changed the criteria for schools to be identified and monitored under the Williams legislation. Um, the new requirements are based on federal legislation, the Every Child Succeeds Act. And essentially, schools who are identified as the lowest performing, who are also accepting Title I funds in our county were the schools that are identified. Um, and additionally, any schools that had 15% or more teachers that were not properly credentialed, we did not have any schools that qualified under that category. So as a County Office of Education, we're required to report on a couple of things. We visit each school annually within the first four weeks of school. We need to identify and assure that they have sufficient instructional materials, so they have textbooks for every child at their school. We also look at the conditions of the facility and make sure everything's in good repair. And then finally, we verify that the information that they're reporting publicly to their families and community members is accurate. So those are the three criteria that we're looking for. Um, as Gail mentioned, um, this year in our Williams review, we reviewed five different schools from four different school districts. So in Auburn Union School District, we had Auburn Elementary and Rock Creek Elementary. In Forest Union School District, we had Forest Hill Divide School. In Roseville Joint, we had Independence High School. And in Tahoe Truckee, we had North Tahoe Middle School. So these are our findings. I'm happy to report all of our findings were very good. Um, Auburn Elementary had sufficient materials, their site was in good repair, or their public information was accurate, and they didn't have any teacher missed assignments or vacancies. Rock Creek was the same, everything was perfect. Um, Forest Hill Divide, again, um, all of their materials, their facilities, um, and their public information was accurate. Um, Independence High School was the same, and North Tahoe Middle School was the same as well. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great report, and good. <laughs> I know these are challenge schools with, uh, you know, a lot of challenges with their population, and it's great to see that your investigation, that they're all performing as expected. Uh, with the materials or with the uh, resources given them. Are there questions or comments, board? Suzanne? Sure, I'll make a comment. Thank you both. Thank you, Gail. Um, after having served on that Placer County Board of Education with Gail for 10 years, um, I have nothing but good things to say about how you've run the whole county schools and the underprivileged schools and everything. You know, these results have been the same for a long time, not just this year. But anyway, I want to thank you all for that and thank you for the opportunity to serve on the board with you. It's a great experience. Thank you very much and I miss your presence on the board as well. <laughs> I miss the board too, but I like this board. I'm glad <laughs> to be here. Holy wait a minute, wait I a minute. I love this board and I'm so happy to be here. To thank you to all, all my supporters, but thank you, Gail. Thank you. Great, thank you both thank you. for being here. Okay, we'll move on then to our 940 timed item. This is found on page three of our board packet. This is a Community Development Resources Agency resolution approving a special assessment and lien against real property for administrative cost of nuisance abatement 1615 River Road Bridge. Hi, Crystal. Good morning. Madam Chair and members of the board, I'm Crystal Jacobson with the Community Development Resource Agency in uh, Tahoe City. Here today to request your board take a couple of actions. Uh, first is to conduct a public hearing to consider a pro proposed special assessment and lien to recover the administrative costs of a nuisance abatement of a bridge located at 1615 River Road in Tahoe City. And then uh, two, to adopt a resolution levying a special assessment in the amount of $62,814.65 against the real property located at 1615 River Road and then direct our agency um, or designee to record a lien in that amount against the property. So by way of background, on October 25th, your board conducted a public hearing uh, to consider a report on the itemized costs, uh, which uh, uh, reported to your board on the 25th totaled $82,160.07 for the nuisance abatement. At that hearing, a representative from the property owner ownership uh, provided testimony and requested your board consider an adjustment 
of that amount. And after considering public testimony, uh, your board took action to reduce the itemized cost, adopting a resolution confirming a total cost of $62,814.65, and then directed our staff to uh, send a demand um, letter to the property owners to pay the cost within five days. Accordingly, on the 26th of October, we did send out the demand letter and gave the property owners until October 31st to remit payment. Um, and to date, payment has not been made. Um, as such, legal notices for today's hearing were posted on the property, published in two uh, newspapers, and then served um, on the property owners in conformance with Section 1556-230F. Uh, um, for the record, I do want to note that out of an abundance of caution, we did notice multiple addresses that had been associated with this uh, property ownership to ensure they received the demand letter and notice for today's hearing. I would like to point out that after we did send out the legal notice, we did receive, um, we, we heard back from one agent address on file, and Mr. Zachary Hilton, who says he's not associated with the property. So I just wanted to state that for the record. Uh, so with that, your board is being asked to consider a proposed special assessment and lien to recover the administrative costs of the bridge at 1615 River Road and adopt a resolution levying a special assessment in the amount of $62,814.65 and directing um, our agency, our designee, to record the lien in that amount against the property. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I will note that we did receive some correspondence from the property. Uh, representative of the property owner, and um, they are not, they could not be here today. Thank you, Crystal. Are there questions for Crystal? Supervisor Jones? Yes, hi, Crystal. Thank you for that report. You said that you uh, had communicated with a representative of the property owners. Did they indicate that they just weren't going to pay, couldn't afford to pay? Or? They did, yeah. There, so there was actually an email that came in. I believe your board was copied on that. Um, yeah, noting that they could not pay at this time and that the payment would come out of the sale. They're trying to sell the property. Okay, great, thank mm -hmm. you. Any other comments or questions, board members? Um, I, I would just add that, you know, I think the board was very fair in reducing some of the costs at, that we did uh, when we heard this item uh, and tried to work with the property owner. I, I feel, um, it is their responsibility when you purchase a piece of property to maintain it. I'm sorry for the situation they find themselves in with this bridge, but it was a public safety issue, and I, I so commend our staff for the quick action uh, to, to deal with uh, what was truly a safety hazard for the public using uh, the Truckee River. Um, so my comments there. And then are there any public comments on this? Oh, I am conducting a public hearing. So I'm going to open the public hearing now. Are there any public comments? I'm not seeing anyone in the room and no one online. So we'll close the public hearing. And then we have a resolution levying a special assessment in that amount of $62,814.65 against the real property located at 1615 River Road, Tahoe City, California with a lot of APN numbers <laughs> listed. And uh, then uh, direct the CEDRA director or designee to record a lien in that amount. Thank you, Supervisors Wygant and Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank, Thank you, you, Crystal. Thanks for all the hard work on that one. Okay. With that, we'll move to our 9.50 time to item, uh, Parks and Open Space. This is an MOU with the State of California related to the Bear River Fishing Access property. Andy Fisher and Maggie are here, Maggie Tides, to present this item. Good morning again, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, this action before you today is to adopt a resolution approving a memorandum of understanding with the State of California acting through its Department of Fish and Wildlife regarding private ranger service at the Bear River Fishing Access property and authorize the chair of the Board of Supervisors to execute that MOU. Um, my name is Andy Fisher, Parks Administrator with Parks and Open Space. Uh, as you mentioned here with Maggie Tides, also Dan Fauner, our Operations Superintendent. And in addition, Kevin Thomas is with us, I believe, online. Kevin is the Regional Manager of the North Central Region of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so Kevin, there's Kevin. Uh, so we'll turn to Kevin in a minute, but I wanted to open up with some background. 
the property that we're talking about today, the Bear River property, is about 200 acres. It's west of Colfax and Weimar, obviously on the Bear River, between Rollins Lake and Comby Reservoir, some of the, in my opinion, most beautiful stretch of river in Placer County. Uh, it was purchased by the Wildlife Conservation Board in 1967. Wildlife Conservation Board is the real estate branch of the Department of Fish and Wildlife and promptly entered into an agreement with Placer County beginning in April 30th of 1968. So Placer County has had a, a role in that property uh, through day use and camping management since 1968. Uh, there's been a couple of different extensions to that agreement over the years, uh, culminating in one with an expiration date of November 12th of 2022. Uh, leading into that expiration date, uh, the county contemplated um, how it would go forward, contemplated even pulling back from our role in that property, and began to have some public meetings to discuss what that would look like going forward. The first of those meetings, the uh, Weimar Applegate Colfax MAC in, on July 20th of this year, where we received a lot of feedback from folks, very constructive feedback. Um, and then again on September 12th, uh, had a town hall meeting in Colfax that was attended by almost 100 people. Uh, so got a lot of, and I, and I will say honestly, I've been in a lot of public meetings. There was a lot of constructive feedback, a lot of good, um, a, a lot of good opinions, very civil, very substantive, and we took a lot away from it. Uh, what we heard from that uh, loud and clear first, I think, and foremost is um, if the county pulls back, what would service look like? Can, you know, you've got to find a way forward to make sure that there is no lapse in, in basic services. That was a probably the primary comment that we heard. Uh, those basic services include patrol, trash, uh, pickup, restroom service, um, land and vegetation management up there, things we've been involved in for years. Uh, we also heard strong desire uh, that the property remain open to the public for use of the trails, for river access, for mining. Um, also heard a desire, we heard pros and cons on the side of camping, whether it would continue. Some folks with a love of camping, some folks without a love of camping. Most of the highest love we heard from camping, for camping was for the group campsite. Um, in response to that, staff um, with Parks and Open Space, County Council began working with Kevin and his staff with, um, with Fish and Wildlife to say, you know, what can we do to respond to these citizen comments? And so what we came up with was uh, the MOU that's before you today, this, the, the staff of both uh, organizations, both agencies have looked through, um, that would continue the basic services for one to two additional years while the state has an opportunity to solve some of the longer range issues. Um, we did have a town hall meeting last week, November 21st, so we wanted an opportunity since we hadn't spoken to the public about what we had in mind since September, we wanted to roll out the contents of this MOU that happened in a Zoom town hall last week. I want to make sure if anybody uh, came today that they'd have um, background information for whatever comments and questions they may have. Um, and so the elements of this MOU, as I began to discuss, it's a one or two year agreement that will continue management of day use at the property. There would not be camping of any kind at the property over the next two years. It would be open to the public. We would, the county, continue to provide uh, patrol, restroom cleaning, trash pickup, ranger service. Our rangers uh, over time, I believe they've been there since, I want to say 2014, maybe earlier, um, they have radio contact with both um, CAL FIRE and the sheriff, so any, because it is poor cell service, but they do have that direct, com that direct contact, they would continue that. Um, sheriff patrol would generally be unaffected. They, they respond to calls and they patrol the area. A county road runs through the middle of it. They patrol it routinely anyway. Um, the, the agreement specifies that Fish and Wildlife would um, increase to the extent they have available their warden presence, particularly issues related to the river, and that they would step up their role, which they've already begun, in the general land management and vegetation management. So the state's already sponsored and paid for conservation corps groups that have been up there doing vegetation management and things like that. So um, that's, that's been great to see that partnership and the state would continue under this agreement. Um, finally, I wanted to cover some of the questions that have come up um, during the town hall and leading up to the meeting today. Folks that were down there, because it is open to the public today, noted that we did remove barbecues, fire rings, and signage that down there, particularly pertaining to the campground. 
Um, and that was a condition of the agreement that expired on November 12th. So we had to comply with that agreement. Uh, we do want to emphasize to folks, though, that was not a decision-making action. Um, if the state finds an operator for camping going forward, they could come back in. We've stored those things. They're still there. You know, it took us just a couple of days to take those things out. That was a compliance issue. It really was not intended to be an indicator of what the future may hold, but we did take those things out. Um, so what else did I have down here? Oh, by, uh, we did also, we've met with uh, staff on site of uh, Fish and Wildlife. We intend to craft new signage to reflect the new management going forward. We should have that up hopefully within the next few weeks. Uh, so we wasn't, wasn't just going to remove signage and leave people in the dark. There'll be new signage going up. People asked about, the county does own 10 adjacent acres to this property that we got during PG&E's um, divestment of some of their properties a few years ago. Um, this agreement um, retains the, uh, the right of entry to that property that would otherwise be landlocked. Uh, the Placer Land Trust holds a conservation easement on that property. They will continue to inspect. They will continue to make sure the conservation values on that 10 acres are intact. And so nothing changes really with that, that 10 acres. Um, again, people asked about camping, not in the next two years. I'm going to turn it over to Kevin in a minute. He, he maybe talk about some of the process that we could enter into going forward, uh, of what that would look like. But over the next one to two years, there is not, in it, um, not camping written into this MOU. Uh, we did get some from the town hall meeting. Folks asked if we could maybe put back some of the picnic tables. Um, and we've talked with Fish and Wildlife, I think, for, you know, the day use, birthday parties, things like that. There is an interest if we can put them in a place that doesn't uh, invite the impression of camping. So we're looking to be able to do that, to put back some of those amenities just for, for day use. Uh, so we're working with the state on there. Uh, folks asked, who's the point of contact? I think it was a really good question. We will make sure that um, our website does have a point of contact. I think it needs to be somewhere. Folks shouldn't have to differentiate between who has what responsibility. We can be that clearinghouse and then get the word out to who needs to do what as things come along. We're also talking about naming the property. We, it'd be misleading to continue, at least from the sense of road signs and things like that, to say campground. So we're working on a, a name change for that with the signage. Folks asked about mining policy. Uh, that's one of the major uses of the property is, is gold mining. There's a state moratorium on any kind of um, of mechanized uh, gold mining equipment, but I think from, the, from, from our standpoint, from the state standpoint, um, the hands, pans, sluice boxes, the way that people mine down there is working today. There's not really a desire to change that, so we hope to keep that just as it is today. It seems to be working. And then finally, finally, I wanted to acknowledge a couple of letters that came in just yesterday that your board has received, one from the city of Colfax, who uh, passed, uh, their board passed a letter, their council passed a letter, with really three items I'll summarize that they were interested in. Um, they believe that it'd be in best interest of the region for the county to continue a presence at the Bear River campground. They believe that there should be a camp host on site and uh, there should be continued efforts to mitigate vegetation. Uh, the second letter that came in yesterday was from a Steve Griffin and he um, stated his long-term uh, use of the campground and recommended a high level of presence there in the future. Uh, so those, I believe, each of you got copies of those. With that, I would like to, uh, to open it up to Kevin, if I may, for some words on behalf of the state. Absolutely. Thank Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me, uh, Supervisors. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to start by saying thanks to Supervisor Gustafson and Mr. Fisher for uh, continuing the coordination of working with us on how we move forward with this land. Um, it's a really nice cooperative effort to, to kind of meet with the community and figure out what our next steps are going to be so that we all feel uh, good about what we can provide the public and the public being able to use the site. Um, uh, Andy filled in most of what's going on right now, so I'll just say from our side that um, we are interested in continuing this working relationship of finding a way to uh, manage the property going forward. At this point, I think that everything is still on the table, whether it be another state agency, a county or NGO or whatever. Um, we're trying to find uh, a participant who's willing to provide the type of service that has been provided because I think that's what the people um, of Placer County and Colfax are looking for. 
Uh, the state can't provide that service. I'll just be upfront about that. Um, we don't manage lands in that manner um, of having campgrounds and um, that type of thing. And so uh, we're gonna have to work to find a, a different solution if that's the way we wanna go. Um, I'm just here to support um, Andy in, in his proposal of the MOU. Um, I've already reviewed it on my end and I'm ready to sign when uh, the board, if they are ready to sign as well and be happy to answer any questions you guys have regarding it or future use of the property as well. So thanks for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, on behalf of the board and staff, we just so appreciated your attendance at some pretty well attended uh, meetings and uh, your honesty and directness about the situation the state finds itself in too. Uh, we appreciate that. Okay, with that, any comments or questions from the board members? I have one. Yes. Um, thank you, Andy, very much for the presentation. And I really, I really do appreciate that there is at least a, a temporary workaround to allow the, the campground to be open to the public, at least for day use. It was really clear that folks want to continue to use that site. Um, so I appreciate the state working with us and getting to that point. Um, one question for you is as far as the costs. and. I asked that earlier, but if you would just clarify, because it looks like the costs that we're approving um, for the the ranger restroom cleaning garbage service are less than what we're currently paying. So could you just uh, re reflect on that for us? Sure, I'll do my best. Um, based on past history, which has been a little up and down, because we've uh, we raised the rates for camping, which increased revenue, and then the campground closed, and so. It's been a little bit of a moving target, but in fiscal year 22, our total expenses at uh, Bear River were $226,527. That was offset by $36,000 in, in an abbreviated camping season. Um, because we won't have, there's a lot of things that are directly related to the camping, checking people in, cleaning up right after they leave, those kind of things. We won't have those costs. We also will not have that revenue. We expect that, um, that the expense, the total expense, uh, would continue with our ranger patrol uh, of about <clears throat> just under 100,000 per year. And then total between that supplies, what our staff invests, would be somewhere in the 150 to 175 revenue. We did model that in this year's budget. And so for fiscal year 22, 23, we do have that in our operating budget. We're prepared to finish off this year. And then we'd work with the CEO in, in the following budget years if right. this MOU is approved. Thank you. Robert? Uh, just a brief comment. I uh, want to compliment you, Cindy, for your leadership on this, but Andy and uh, our state agency staff, I think we have a great interim uh, step solution here. Um, it's easy to retract on these kinds of things and do nothing, but I don't think that's who we are in Placer County, and I think our citizens uh, would demand higher of us. And other than that, I'm personally always supportive of another place to fish. So. <laughs> Uh, I just want to highlight my thanks and appreciation for I know it was uh, challenging and then difficult and it's an ongoing question, but I think you guys have come to a really good place. Great. Thanks I, for those comments. Appreciate I might make one additional comment as Kevin and I were talking. We all think about a, breathing a, you know, kind of a sigh of reprieve if you approve this MOU today. Wow, we've got one to two years, but we all know that goes by quickly. I think we're in a good position to provide meeting space. We have contact lists. Um, I think it's in our interest to support the state in their endeavors to find the best long-term management solution, and we intend to work with the state in the near term to get started, because I think that time will go by quickly and, and help them out. Andy, I had one quick question. Um, are, we removed the signage relative to camping. Do we have new signage for no overnight camping or parking? Because I know shortly after I took office, there were people that were just parking and so there, facto there are camping and i think that's a concern for the neighbors and community members absolutely um the two different um legal status down there one is the county road which would be managed under our own no parking ordinance so i think we can look at that if that becomes a rising issue now with day use along that county road we can look at that in the no parking ordinance um, but yes we do intend to post down there uh, that there is no camping and direct people to where parking is available. So we've been talking with the state about where should we allow it, two to three places probably to allow parking and then eliminate it elsewhere for day so, use. 
Well, day use, absolutely, but for overnight. No overnight. No overnight in the no whole overnight. vicinity. And I think that's a significant concern for the neighbors because without a host down there, um, what we start to see with um, the behaviors down there create issues. So, appreciate. Supervisor Gustafson, yes. can I chime in really quick on yes, that? Yes, I am. Um, so, uh, under our code, I, as regional manager, am allowed to um, open or close a property to camping, which means that I can just simply write um, write a memo stating that it's opened or closed. It's going to be closed, and both our law enforcement and your law enforcement can enforce our code on the property as well. So it will be able to be enforced that there's no camping there based on our fishing game code. That's great to hear because I know that's been an issue in other locations where we haven't had that enforcement without signage. So I appreciate that, Kevin, very much. Okay, are there any uh, members of the public that would like to address this item? I'm not seeing anyone here. Are there any people on Zoom that would like to address this item? We do. Frank, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Frank, can you unmute your mic? Frank, we see your hand up, but we we need you to unmute. There you go. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Good morning, <laughs> Good morning Chairwoman Augustuson and board members. I am a neighbor of the property that you're discussing with the MOU, and I'd like to first congratulate the county and the fish and wildlife to coming to an agreement and a hopefully a temporary bridge if you will for this MOU um, but what I would like to really emphasize is the history that the county's had with this property and the knowledge they've gained in managing it I think it is a uh, great spot that's given the constituents of the county and the residents uh, a great place to recreate and now transitioning to an open space uh, area I would hope that the county with the 50 years of experience would use that to model uh, this property similar to the how they've used Hidden Falls and uh, make a long-term plan with the fish and wildlife as opposed to trying to hand this off to another entity that doesn't have the responsibility or the experience managing this. Excuse me. Uh, secondly, I would hope that the funds moving forward for fiscal year 22-23 or 23-24 um, are secured because as I, as I said, the history with this in 50 years uh, is important and since the county was able to get the indemnification that seemed to be the, the uh, hurdle to managing this property, uh, I would hope that, like I say, the funds are secured. Uh, and finally, uh, I would I want to thank again Fish and Wildlife and Andy Fisher in particular, because I think at this time the residents of the area feel more confident that this property will be managed uh, better moving forward and, and has been done quite well in the past. So thank you and uh, we look forward as a public to having more interaction and input uh, with this property in the next two years. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate those comments. Are there other members of the public who would like to address the board? I see none, Chair. Oh, we have one more now. Steve, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, um, I didn't see my letter that I sent in as part of the documents. Um, so if you would indulge me, I'd like to go ahead and read it real quick to you. Is that possible? Yes. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, board. My name is Steve Griffin. Um, I know my time is limited, so I wrote this out. And I also wrote this out before Mr. Fisher's, um, Mr. Fisher made his comment this morning. So um, he addressed some of this. But anyways, um, our group has been using the Bear River Group Campground for approximately 45 years. Our hope is that the county will recommit itself to the Bear River Campground and day use area. 
We understand this is a complex issue with several competing interests. The river fire was terrifying and devastating, but please keep in mind that it was caused by an illegal fire, not by responsible campers. We are the ones that are your eyes and ears down there. Closing the campgrounds and having an employee of a contractor who cleans the restrooms and empties the trash twice a week and calling them a ranger is not going to make the area and local residents any safer from fire or other issues. It's a false sense of security. Everyone wants greater oversight um, presence down there. These issues can be resolved and the public has suggested many solutions that appear to have been dismissed. Sounds like you're gonna revisit them. And then um, I was mentioning that Ms., uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Gustafson or uh, Board President Gustafson uh, had a great summary of the public meeting and that I also had my letter, the letter from Colfax, which I believe um, I had sent in to the um, board clerk. So I'm glad they included it because I wasn't sure if the rest of the board had seen that letter from the city of Colfax. Um, I'm almost, I'm getting there. Um, so the board is being asked to rubber stamp this one year agreement that is before you. What it is really about is closing camping at the Bear River Campground and not just about providing ranger services as action item one states. It appears parks and open space has already made this decision uh, despite what they have told the public. The MOU before you states that only day use will be supported. Uh, that is also uh, why they state in their documents that they wish to revise Placer County Code Article 12.24 public recreation areas there will be no revenue now at all from Bear River. This new MOU also states that the fire rings barbecues uh, will be uh, removed by March 1st. And I had in here, are you aware that they've already removed these items along with all the picnic tables? Um, I mentioned that during the Zoom meeting last week. Um, they stated that they will, I guess, put some of those picnic tables back. Because people, I've seen people, home study groups down there, Bible study groups, want to at least sit at a picnic table. Um, Getting there, um, um, Placer County Parks and Open Space has waited for a 25 year contract to expire because it expired on the 12th. And then they put this boards back up against the wall and the county at risk with this one year MOU with a you know, potential to extend it one more. Um, as the board, you have the option to modify the suggested action on this item and give further direction to county staff. We would like to see the board Gret give direction to parks and open space to work with your procurement services department. One of the best I might add in the area, as I am a retired purchasing agent risk manager, to issue a request for proposal for campground and day use management services, see what kind of proposals are received, require they have an on-site host, as the city of Colfax has indicated they would like, negotiate agreeable terms and conditions, transfer the risk to the contractor by having them contractually hold the county and the state harmless, allow the contractor to increase fees to help cover costs. The group campground rents out for the whole season in a matter of minutes. Um, demand is very high. Um, see what price the market will bear. No one um, swinging by twice a week to clean toilets and empty trash uh, and calling them a ranger is, making, is not making the place any safer. Um, the only way to have proper oversight of the Bay, Bear River day use and campground area will be obtained if uh, you contract this out and have a host. The county could place an Mr. employee Griffin. back down on the property like they used to, um, but we don't think that is likely. And now in closing, if the county decides to eliminate camping, which we hope it doesn't, um, then why should the county even take on the risk of running the day use area, which is on state property? The MOU um, for the proposed range of services two times a week is unreasonable for any prudent person standard and exposes the county to risk potential for um, legal liability so something bad happen again. California Department of Fish and Wildlife has already stated that they will continue to operate. Mr. Bear Griffin, River. I do need you to wrap up. Um, and we I got do two have more sentences. You. Two more sentences. Um, so the the state has said they will continue to operate the access even if the county fully backs out. So if you're not going to allow camping and a contractor to provide management services on the site, the county should protect itself, limit its legal bot liability, and just get out of the matter altogether. But the state figure out how to responsibly manage the use area and assume the risk of the area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And, and we did have your comment in our packet uh, along with the letter from the city and some others. So thank you for reiterating your concerns. I appreciate your comments. Okay, are there other members of the public that would like to address the board? Okay, then I'll come back to the board for any discussion, questions. Uh, Andy, did you want to address any of those comments? Um, I think 
I nothing specifically, yeah. no. Okay. Then I'd entertain a motion. Second. Holmes and Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. I think this was a great effort. And Kevin uh, from the state, I appreciate the cooperation. We have a couple of years to continue to discuss what we do here. So thank you. We'll move to our 10.05 timed item. This is item four on our agenda, Community Development Resource Agency General Plan Update Workshop, page 23 of our board packets. Thank you, board. Chris Schmidt with the Planning Services Division. And congratulations, Jane, on your new title. So the item before you today is uh, potentially the first step in a long process that CEDRA staff is uh, proposing a long overdue update of the county's general plan. And as you know, the state requires each municipality in California to have a general plan. It has to be com comprehensive, integrated, internally consistent with compatible policies. It also must include development policies with land use maps. The state also provides us guidance of what a general plan must contain and that guidance was last updated in 2017, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So what is the general plan? The general plan is the citizen's blueprint for development, which guides a, a, and a guide to achieving a collective vision. It serves as a basis for decisions that affect the county's growth and development, such as transportation, land use, streets, and infrastructure, parks, housing and neighborhoods, recreation, in community facilities, the environment, public health, safety, and sustainability. The general plan is a, a strategic and long-term document identifying goals and policies that guides and directs the county in terms of implementing those policies, programs, and resources. It's our vision for the future. It guides uh, county departments with their strategic goals and policy. It's everyone's basis for land use decisions and growth management within the unincorporated placer. It guides our physical appearance and it allows for, impl for accountable implementation. So the 1994 general plan was our last comprehensive update and it served us well. At that time, it was envisioned as a 10 to 20 year plan. There's a few notable projects that came out of that 94 plan, including Bickford Ranch, which was approved in 2004, covering 1,900 acres and 1,890 residential housing units even an Appendix C that laid out the guidelines for that project. Also, Placer Vineyards, the significant specific plan in the West Placer area approved in 2007, covering 5,000 acres and 14,540 homes. Their project is currently under construction as well. Also, Placer Legacy kicked off in 2000, and this was an effort to preserve uh, habitat and open space in the county. And most significantly, the PCCP, which was called for in the 94 general plan, adopted in September of 2020 with a 50-year horizon and a goal of preserving over 47,300 acres in western Placer County. The county did do a 2003 update, which is a policy update of the general plan. And it updated antiquated code references, streets, diagrams, and policies, uh, incorporated Complete Streets Act, uh, language that the state required and a discussion about best management practices and also included a disadvantaged communities discussion that update did not change any land use it did not change the land use diagram it also did not impact the capital improvement plan program so as you know the county has seen significant changes over the years uh, land use changes uh, in the cities and elsewhere a significant growth uh, infrastructure uh, changes and also challenges. Housing affordability is a, a, a big issue these days. Our conditions and priorities have changed over time. There's been a whole bunch of new state laws that we need to respond to. Uh, recently, we did a, adopt a sustainability plan, which the state requires. And we also, as I noted, the PCCP completion, which really sets um, the future growth boundaries for Western Placer. So our general plan should align with the PCCP. So why update? So the state law generally requires that a general plan have a 20-year planning horizon and be reviewed every so often as necessary. All zoning and de development regulations must conform to our adopted general plan. 
It needs to be updated to reflect changes in land use, resource management, community needs, and community values, which have changed over time. So with the new general plan, we can set a new vision for the county. We can address current opportunities, challenges, and trends. New perspectives on land use and environmental issues have changed. There's been significant changes to demographics and, and the economic environment since 94. It's also an opportunity to, to connect with our residents and reaffirm values and priorities. We also need to address changes in state law and how communities address housing, mobility, climate change, and environmental justice issues. So in 2017, the State uh, Office of uh, Planning and Research updated their general plan guidelines. It was the first update since 2003. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of new issues that general plans must address. We do address some of these in our current plan, but the others uh, we only touch on, so we'll have to address them in any new update. There's also mandatory elements. These are the chapters every general plan must uh, address. And what staff is proposing is looking at a 2050 planning horizon for a comprehensive general plan update. Uh, envision this to be a four to five year uh, work program. We've started laying the groundwork with doing background research uh, this year. Uh, formally kicking off with the board approves would be sometime uh, middle of 2023. We would be looking at land use changes. We're also looking at community plan consolidation, which we'll talk about. And we'll also have to do an environmental impact report. So one of the things the state has been uh, pushing for and steering communities to do is do a healthy community plan. And this is an integral approach in which health and well-being is woven throughout your plan. It's an overall goal of improving public health and supporting the natural and built environment. It also recognizes that land use, design, and transportation decisions have impacts on local air quality, water quality, supply, traffic safety, and physical activity. And these are elements are worth highlighting due to their broad impact on neighborhood and community shape, character, and activities, and in turn on their ability to be a healthy place to live, work, and play, which is really the overall goal of county government. So what does a healthy community plan look like? So a healthy community plan recognizes that health and well-being of our residents are fundamental to their quality of life and economic vitality. A protection of the public health, safety, and welfare of residents is the legal basis for land use regulation. You see that in findings in your land use decisions. However, health considerations have only been implicit and not fully dis discussed and or analyzed in our general plan. So how that lays out, there's a couple examples of, of things the county does that impacts uh, public health. A goal of promoting physical activity can be a strong rationale for mixed-use walkable communities. Likewise, identifying the many health benefits of green space may add priority to the goals of the open space and recreation elements. So current community plans. We have 15 uh, community plans dating back to 1968 with the Alpine Meadows community plan, and most recently in 2019, the board adopted the Sunset Area Plan. So one thing we're, we're considering, or the board will be considering, is what we do with those existing community plans. And one thing to do would be not include them in the general plan update. So exclude them and they stand, stand they remain as a standalone uh, document. We could eliminate some of the community plans where we just merge them into the general plan. We could include them as appendices to the community plan as an area plan or community area plan. We could also add a new area plan from one or more areas of the county. And on the opposite spectrum, add a new standalone plan or specific plan. So those sub-area plans, as we're calling them, we would divide placer into sub-areas, most likely following the community plan boundaries that exist today. It would be an effective way to address community needs and to focus planning efforts in smaller areas of the county. The sub-area plans written with direct citizen involvement would be a key element in maintaining stable land use patterns in the county. And each of those sub-area plans would have very specific uh, goals and also land use um, addressing those areas, including uh, issue identification, updating the land use, uh, community-specific policies, also community-specific design guidelines. So an effort like this is going to involve uh, extensive community outreach. The plan needs input and review by those affected most and those being our residents. 
So community outreach and engagement is an essential component of any general plan that embodies the community's shared values and goals for the future and is critical, critical to the plan's success. This will include board of supervisors and planning commission meetings and workshops, newsletters, online engagement. Based on board direction, the following would play key roles in the update, including staff in the various departments, a general plan advisory committee, which would be appointed by the board, the planning commission and the municipal advisory councils, uh, sub-area plan committees, it could be from the MAX or separate, separately created planning committees, and a, an extensive consultant team. With board approval, we would begin talking about what a general plan update would look like. Staff would refine the work plan, do additional data collection. We would go out to the MAX and talk about the effort that would be kicked off shortly. We'd also reach out and talk to LAFCO and the, the cities and the community and eventually we would release an RFQ or an RFP for a consultant team to help us prepare the document. And with that, staff is looking for board direction on whether to proceed with the general plan update, and if so, to direct staff to refine the scope of work and prepare a request for proposals for a general plan update consultant team, review responses to the request for proposals, make a re recommendation to the board regarding the selection of a consultant to assist with the general plan update, and finally, to make reports to the board as needed regarding the progress of the general plan update. And if the board approves of the general plan update, staff will return at a future date with the formal work plan for consideration, as well as a detailed accounting of estimated costs for completing the general plan update. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. Great presentation. Um, big project. Yes, Supervisor Holmes? Did you? <laughs> Are there any questions or comments, board members? Robert, you don't get to see this through, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> a couple of great, great job, Chris. We're looking for volunteers for working groups. <laughs> I'll, I've got committees I'll, you could I'll look be around and to. see if I know anyone. <laughs> um, just one uh, couple of comments. Great, great work, great scope scale of the project. I think it's a really rich opportunity with the progress that we've made and, and the foundation that we have to work on. I would um, recommend um, uh, working with our cities in a constructive and healthy way, which doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily agree with them, uh, but uh, we certainly should try to find common ground as much as possible, and I'll give a couple of personal examples that you're aware of, Chris. Um, but uh, when the Sunset Area Plan was adopted, it was based on a pretty simple policy foundation, which was it was a place set aside for job creation. So it prohibited a lot of activities, like inherently residential, um, uh, unless they could make the case that uh, that was necessary for their jobs creation goal, or the county's jobs creation goal. So, so you know, the first big project that came out of that, of course, was the Placer Ranch project, Placer One now. Um, and uh, in working with Roseville, Rockland, and Lincoln, uh, they expressed some concerns about the impact on them, which is understandable. And one of the things that came out of that dialogue was that as the project went forward, uh, a lot of us were concerned, including me, that the county didn't create a circumstance where we were sucking sales tax revenue from those cities. Um, and so the project uh, agreed to propose um, sales tax uh, within the project that they thought was necessary, but to fit the scale and scope of the project itself and not to be uh, a destination center that would take the revenue from the cities. And so it, that's never perfect, but, um, uh, but we, and in this case, uh, I think I would I'll say that it was probably underappreciated by our city partners to a large extent, but in fact, we, we did do that. There was an economic study that was done uh, in that analysis, and um, I think the outcome is better than it would have been otherwise. Another example is kind of a s s small example, but I think it expresses that dynamic well, and that is uh, we had a project that was pro proposed adjacent to the big, it actually started in a, a process, uh, Bigford Marketplace, and um, in the setting for me, in the context of all of that, uh, the city's uh, Lincoln's general plan uh, has adequate sales tax capture for it and the area around it, and they need that sales tax capture. Um, and one of 
uh, the dynamic of the city general plan is that they're actually forcing people who live in close proximity to Bickford to go downtown to shop. They didn't create adequate sales tax within their communities, their villages, uh, because they wanted to reinvigorate their downtown. And I think it, it's important for us to respect that. And, and we have done that. And it makes sense in a global sense. If you look at the whole area, there's no need for more rezoning of uh, sales tax in that area. And, and we did that. And there will be other issues and times where we just simply disagree uh, because the cities may want some of the projects that are going to be going forward in the county now. But I would just make the case to, I know you'll do a great job of taking a look at uh, globally the whole county and uh, where the pieces are going to come to fit together now. And uh, there'll be a lot of growth that, that is called out for in the city of Lincoln and in the county. Um, but uh, just to work to the fullest extent possible to get that input and for the board not to be reticent to explain to the cities that you know they may not perfectly like everything we're doing, but uh, we have good policy reasons for making the decisions we're, we're making. Thanks, Robert. Other comments or questions? I, um, I would um, support what Supervisor Wygant said. I, I do think outreach is going to be critical um, and and really presenting um, the pros and cons of these issues. I think in my briefing, um, I, I came to understand just a bit about the complexities of the work that you undertake with such a large endeavor. Um, but I, I see it firsthand in some of the antiquated plans and what's allowed in certain zoning. And I recently had a situation uh, in a neighborhood in which uh, uh, somebody acquired a piece of property and we're desperately needing housing but my understanding is they're going to be looking at taking down a building and making a contractor's yard so I looked into it and of course that's allowed in the zoning and I thought well gosh you know we're not up to date because that isn't what the community today would look at for that area so I think it's really important to get out to the community and to get their input and really understanding of the zoning, the complexities of zoning, and what these uh, community plans, area plans, general plans, how they overlay and, and how important it is to get their input today and the issues that we're facing. Um, housing is just so critical in certain areas of our county and we need to find ways to um, incentivize because we have plenty of cost factors into creating any sort of affordable or achievable housing. And so how do we incentivize those programs as just one opportunity? And when we look at VMT and, and transportation and our corridors uh, and the growth around our county, it's not just how things have changed in our county, but what's changed around us and what do we need to uh, be prepared for as we look at the future because I think often we're being hit with complaints about issues that you know north of us east of us west of us south of us have contributed to what we face in especially in transportation issues so um, I think it's such an important and major project and I wish it could get done quicker than four to five years but understanding the complexity it's going to take that long and um, I really appreciate stepping forward and getting this going yeah. we, we definitely agree it's it's going to be a giant undertaking especially with the community outreach component but if you've looked at our recent past we've been updating community plans maybe two every decade so if you do the math we're looking at 70 years to everyone get an updated community plan so the consolidation i know there's going to be a lot of discussion about the loss of community identity if they lose the community plan but the one thing we're going to say is the benefit is you don't lose that identity, you're a sub-area plan, you're just losing those overarching policies that'll be spelled out in the general plan itself. But what it does do, it gets you on the cycle of general plan updates. So the community plan, sub-area plans will be updated with the general plan, which could be every 15 to 20 years instead of every 30 to 40 years. So that is the overriding benefit of doing these sub-area consolidations. But at the end of the day, it will be a public and board decision of mm -hmm what direction we head with those. Yeah, I appreciate that because I, I do think when you look at 1968, a lot has changed. Yeah. <laughs> Can some, I some supervisors weren't born then, were they? 
<laughs> I may not look like it, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Supervisor Gore, you had a question. Well, uh, to that point, I appreciate it, Chris. And as I look at the community plans, right, some since 1968 and a couple are more recent, can you share with us this idea of consolidation? Because I, I do think it makes a lot of sense to um, bring it all under one roof. At the same time, there are communities that have some really different that they have different identities than other areas, right? And in um, in some areas, it's changed dramatically. Like the Dry Creek um, specific plan is very what's there now is very different than what was talked about 30 years ago, right? So how do how are you envisioning us breaking it? I mean, are there areas versus specific plans? I know we're, we were talking about maybe taking out specific plans, but are you looking at certain areas or how might you envision breaking that up so that communities get their interests addressed, um, yeah. but doing it all at one time? That's a good question. So on some of these on the list, the current community plans, there's been really no development happening. And I'll point to Ofer and Colfax. It really doesn't make sense for them to have their own community plan. So those would probably go away in part of the general plan, in general plan land use diagram. Others, such as Tahoe Basin Area Plan, I don't think anyone wants to touch that. It's a different. <laughs> what are you just, doing tomorrow night? <laughs> it's been recently adopted. It's got such, such specific Tahoe specific guidelines. It just makes sense to bring it into the general plan. Same with Sunset. It's got its own implementing zoning and rules. So that one's probably hands off. The other ones are probably all fair game. So it's really going to be a community decision of what they think is best for their community. I think Some, they're going to want their identity, but I think we have to educate on the benefits. Um, that, you know, how be, much new development is there, and, and do they need a separate plan for that, or can it be under other ways to it? Right. Are there other ways to preserve their community character without necessarily a separate right. plan? And maybe incorporate sub areas into the plan, right? Sub like Granite, right. Bay, Great, Granite Bay is going to have some specific. Um, differences that might be different. Right. Meadow Vista is another Other one. Where, yeah. Right. So you could have some right. sub plans within, correct? So many of our community plans have very specific design guidelines for quarters. Granite Bay's got the Douglas Boulevard design guidelines. Those wouldn't go away. Okay. It, if it became part of the general plan, it would be part of an appendix. So it would it would remain. So those areas of concern for communities that are really important to them can be. Um, identified and left alone or addressed so that they're not forgotten. Or there could be a new sub area plan. For instance, you know, Penryn seeing a lot of growth. Maybe we have a specific area of a sub area plan for the Penryn Parkway area, for instance. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions, board members? Well, there's somebody standing behind you, so I know we have at least one member of the public who would like to address the item. Thank you. My name is Richard Lingenjo. I think I've probably bored you in the past somewhat with my qualifications. I've built large projects, several hospitals, airport, light rail project, consult, construction consultant for the University of California. So I have some background in large projects. Um, I. Uh, out of my ignorance, I missed the meeting yesterday uh, talking about this very issue. And uh, I, I appreciate this morning uh, Supervisor Holmes educating me on some, some ways to get involved more. And uh, so, uh, as you might imagine, I'm, I'm uh, not going to, at any, at any point in the near future, identify any potential site for my project because you can imagine what would happen to property values. So, uh, but I'm very interested, of course, in the plan. And I'm hoping that I don't get a plan that excludes my project. Uh, and so I'm very interested in the sub area and land use part of the, of the general plan. I've been involved in some planning in the past, of course, with the projects that I've done. Uh, 
uh, and so I'm somewhat familiar with the proce uh, process and I'm just uh, very interested in getting more involved and accumulating some of the documents that have already been uh, produced, if, uh, if I could. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate your comments. Are there any other members of the public that would like to address this item? I not seeing. Oh, yes, Mr. Garabedian. Thank you. Yes, Mike Garabedian, uh, Pacific to American Divide and Placer tomorrow, Placer County tomorrow. I have so many comments, I can just make a couple of them here. There's just not time. Uh, so I'll start with the, the, uh, the needed for the emphasis on fire. I know there's fire in there, but the county has been expanding fire irresponsibly and radically with the, even the proposals named here. Now the PCCP is an example of public involvement failed. It's a complete failure in terms of public involvement. The public doesn't know what it is. It can go into detail on that. Um, eliminating community plans, very bad idea. But let me say one ma major thing. Yesterday, the morning session you had, which I listened through the break. I don't know what happened after the break, but before the break, there were comments here about which of the four uh, financial options you preferred without asking for public comment before you did that. And please don't do that on this, because before you send this to, to our, 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 the re our request for proposals and come out with a work plan, get the public involved. You have a number of key people who understand planning here, and you should not be doing any of that until you people weigh in on these decisions now, not, not just the ones I'm, I'm trying to rush through here. Um, we have a transportation disaster happening in Placer County, South Placer, and not, and not 60 or 50 or 60,000. It's a, a potentially many, many more units than that. It's going to be a disaster. Even the plans proposed aren't going to relieve the transportation anyway, shape or form. Um, so it can be, the communities can, uh, need, uh, they need something like um, their own sphere of influence. The, the communities need to be able to say, this is our community, and this is how we are, and this is how we want to remain, or how we're going to change. They need some authority. You know, kind of like under, under LAFCO, you have uh, s spheres of influence. Well, the county, I think, may even have that in their own LAFCO rules, though it's not a state law. But something, some way to give those communities a say in what happens to them, un unlike what's happened in, say, uh, the expansion of Hidden Falls in my opinion, definitely. Um, so uh, where to go? <laughs> and all these uh, scribbled notes here. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, um, the, the community plan changes. Uh, uh, are can be very foresightful. You know, the 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 uh, Forest Hill Divide, one of the two in the last period of time, was litigated, and it led to a fire study, a fire study, that even the discussion of that. A member of the Planning Commission said they could imagine a fire coming up the hill to Forest Hill, which is exactly what happened. It was stopped before the store, of course, but the, you have been approving right and left subdivisions like Bickford Ranch that are just terrible from a fire prevention point of view, putting people on top of a ridge. Uh, and, and dividing properties, uh, minor division after, to minor division, cutting them up into small lots, which is great for people to live out there, but it's putting them in, in danger of fire. So I really think the main point is you need to get public involvement at this stage right now because there are some really thoughtful and careful people who understand what's, not just yourselves and your amazing understanding of what's going on and what you've done for years, but you need to involve the public, I would say, right now at this phase. Good luck. Thank you. And that's the reason for our meeting today, to make sure the public's well aware that we're starting this process. So I think well taken, well, well said. And are there other members of the public? Okay, Jane, you had a comment? Just a quick comment and a compliment for Chris. Great presentation, thorough overview of kind of a preview of coming attractions for the general plan to come. I'd also like to thank Cedar Director David Kwong for his efforts to share information with all of our operating departments on Placer's changing landscape. And I would ask whenever it's appropriate that we do so again to share the work ahead in which many of our operating departments will also want to kind of understand and play a role and to leverage some of the great work that's being done. I was particularly interested in your comments on the healthy community plan and HHS has done quite a bit of work with the Resilient Placer Coalition Supervisor Holmes and I went to a forum at the end of August to share out that work for which a lot of community input has already been exercised. So again, how do we kind of bring this to the whole organization to leverage some of the great work that's already been done to inform the general plan? 
those are good points. And I know it's been discussed with the different departments and they've already been reaching out with how do we get involved, when, when's the internal working group start? So I think there's a lot of excitement from everyone to finally get this long overdue update going. Yeah, if I can add, uh, Chair and Board and Jean, this is not CDRA's general plan. This is the county's general plan. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we're glad the departments are interested, but we really want their participation as well because they're part of the stakeholder group. Um, we're going to have internal stakeholders and we're going to have a lot of external stakeholders. We want to do it right. You know, the last time we did it was almost, I guess it was 28 years ago. And this is another 20 year plan, so we've got to do it right. Um, trying to do also avoid lawsuits, but we'll see. Thanks. Great. Yes, Bonnie. And if, and if I might add, I think Richard, uh, excuse me, Robert alluded to that, but having some of our city partners participate in the process um, as the county has areas of growth. Um, you know, originally back 30 years ago, the um, housing was supposed to take place <coughs> primarily in the cities, and and that's that's changed and so we want to make sure that we're working with our cities as we're looking at what's happening along their borders and our borders and if there's conversations about annexation I just think it's really important that we're working with our cities to make sure that I mean, we may not agree right but that we hear their their concerns um, and be open to to working with them Great. Well, we have some board direction, suggested board direction on the screen up here. Um, and so uh, I think you're hearing that this is first off long overdue and I think the board supports moving forward with the general plan update. Um, you've asked about refining the scope of work or just directing staff to consolidate the scope of work. And then to move forward with those, does anyone like to, do you want a formal action on this? We didn't post no, it that way, so this direction. is just staff direction. Yeah, yeah I think we've, we've heard the board is in support. Uh, what we'll be doing is we do have a draft work plan. Uh, we'll be refining that. We'll be sending it around to various departments for feedback. We'll start a road show. We'll, we'll start going out to the max saying here's what's coming, here's our ideas. Just get early feedback on that. And then refine that work plan, bring it back to you, and then go out to get a request for proposals from cons consultants. Most likely going to be a consultant team. They usually have uh, economics, uh, outreach, of course, land use, and whatever other areas of expertise that we need to uh, prepare the plan. Great. Any other comments, board members? The only thing I might suggest is that we do try to do surveys and opportunities for people to provide input without having to come to meetings uh, because often people are busy in their lives but they do really value if we ask them in that public involvement stage to kind of educate and get uh, feedback I think it would be extremely helpful. Um, we, we expect to have a general plan landing page on the website right. within probably a week or so and start doing sign-ups for newsletters and email blasts and then let people know when workshops and other events are happening. Yeah, because I think often people have, you know, what are your big, biggest concerns? And that, I think, would be very informative to the board uh, as we're looking at the general plan as well as our planning commission as well as those involved directly. And I appreciate that idea of surveys and then in addition to in-person meetings, right, we're seeing that Zoom meetings, people will show up and pay attention. Um, and and those recorded means are really helpful for folks, right? Because then they can play it back when they have an opportunity and then provide feedback. So I think that we've seen that Zoom is a uh, a great way to inform people and hear and, and hear back from folks as you do workshops. I think that's really important. Perfect. Any other comments? Great. Well, thank you for the update. As, as stated, this was an update for the public to understand where we're headed. And stay tuned. It looks like after the first of the year, you're going to be very busy. They already are. <laughs> oh, you already are. That's right. OK. Um, then we'll move to our department items next. And item number six, Health and Human Services. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> item number five. I didn't want to skip you, Rebecca. 
the Community Development Resource Agency. This is a grading ordinance update, and we do have an amendment that is being passed out now for our, dis, um, for our understanding on this item. So, Rebecca. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I also wanted to say congratulations to Jane on your new title. Uh, Rebecca Tabor, Deputy Director for the Engineering and Surveying Division. And with me is Josh Hunsinger, your Agricultural Commissioner. This item is a grading ordinance update. So Placer County Code, uh, Article 15.48, is titled the Grading, Erosion, and Sediment Control Ordinance. We often just refer to it as the grading ordinance. The last technical update by ESD was in 2006. And the primary purpose of this ordinance is to safeguard life, health, and property related to grading activities and also to avoid pollution to water courses. The purpose of our update really is to clarify some grading permit requirements and also give farmers some regulatory relief from state requirements and provide more county oversight over problematic grading activities. Just a couple quick slides on our grading program. Um, this slide shows the grading permit triggers. It lists them. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, but I, I did want to point out uh, some differences. So uh, over 250 cubic yards of material uh, being moved on a site requires a grading permit. But in the Tahoe Basin, it's more strict. It's a three cubic yard um, limit that requires a grading permit. Um, there's some other differences. But um, we're not proposing any changes to these grading permit triggers with this ordinance update. Uh, the only thing that, that we do want to, to change in, and clarify, really, is that retaining walls equal to four feet, as measured from the bottom of a footing to the top of the retained soil, are not subject to a grading permit. Um, it's a little ambiguous the way the code is written right now, and that is actually what you have your handout is, is uh, clarifying that for the, the ordinance change. Um, and then one thing to point out here as well is that grading directly below a structure that has a building permit is not subject to a grading permit. That grading under the structure is part of the building permit itself. And then just to give you an idea of our grading permit activity for our division, um, the last couple years we've been processing and, and issuing over 300 grading permits in the blue there. Um, so we were trending up on grading permits in general. And then the red, uh, those are the, com uh, the complaints that we receive in the Auburn office. Uh, about 50 a year in general, and about half of those complaints do result in grading permits. And then our Tahoe division, um, our Tahoe office receives about 10 complaints a year related to grading. So back to the proposed updates for, for now. Um, what we're looking at adding is an embankment and excavated pond requirements into county code. For a couple decades, we've been using a supplemental handout with the pond requirements, and these are for large ponds, 250 cubic yards or more of um, cut and fill. And um, this really will just get it into the ordinance. We're going to clarify where drainage alteration causes a violation, um, restore some lines of, of code that were inadvertently admitted with a, the 2020 PCCP changes. So we're putting those back in. Uh, we're proposing some fee relief for private vehicular bridges. When there's an emergency repair, what we're proposing is that half of the fee would be required because there's a hardship on those. Um, usually it's uh, small property owners. And then clarify some grading uh, permit requirements for the Tahoe Basin. Additionally, um, we're proposing that the same seasonal restrictions on grading in snow areas be applied um, for all snow areas over 5,000 square feet between, so that's between October 15th and May 1st. Allowing electronic grading permit processing and adding special inspection requirements for retaining walls, sound walls, private vehicular bridges, and pond embankments. We already require these special inspections, so it's nothing new. Um, we're just putting it into the section of the ordinance that talks about special inspection. Probably our more significant change we're making is related to agricultural operations. 
So the first thing we're, we're doing is updating the definition of agricultural operation and now calling it bona fide agricultural operation. Um, the, the current definition's on the left, proposed definition on the right. Um, the primary change I'll just point out is that, that this has to be, the agricultural operation has to be determined by our Ag Commissioner, um, and that is for new operations. Before grading starts, that determination needs to be made. So our current ordinance only states that grading for agricultural operations is exempt unless it endangers people or obstructs drainage. So it's a very broad exemption, and that was what we wanted to address here. Um, a few years ago, in 2019, a sub-watershed group called the Placer Nevada South Sutter North Sacramento, a lot of letters there, PNSSNS Subwatershed Group asked Placer County to adopt a more detailed ordinance with guidelines that their members could work within for compliance with Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board regulations. There are about 300 uh, members, farmers, um, that, are, that are covered in Placer County. So what we're proposing to address this are really six criteria um, that would need to be met for the agricultural operation to be exempt. So the, the grading must be exclusively for agricultural purposes and not associated with a building that requires a building permit, a commercial access road, or a pond that requires a grading permit. Uh, the grading would not be within 30 feet of a water body or water course. There would be no uh, resulting cuts or fills greater than a two to one ratio and the grading would not be on slopes um, greater than 20 percent. And then the operation would need to follow current best management practices for agricultural sediment and erosion control as approved by our agricultural commissioner, especially during rain events or when soils are saturated. And then dust control measures are implemented consistent with the right to farm ordinance and local air district requirements. Um, really important to point out that we also added an exemption there that routine cultivation of crops is specifically exempt. So just a few examples to kind of show what does this look like. Um, in the upper left corner, this picture shows a tractor disking an existing rice field, and this would be routine cultivation. It's just exempt. Um, upper right corner, we've got a, a picture of a tractor doing some deep ripping. So here, if this is for a new orchard preparation, this landowner would need to talk to Josh first and get in writing determination that he's, uh, they are working towards an orchard, and that would be bona fide ag, so that would be exempt as long as they're following the criteria. And then the, the bottom pictures there are kind of showing you know, there's no bona fide ag determined, um, there's no BMPs, 20, it's greater than 20% slope, it's, it's heavy winter rain, so a grading permit would be required in that instance. And then, just to point out, we did outreach to the Agricultural Commission, and they are in support of these changes. Um, we do plan, if, if adopted, to continue outreach through the county website, uh, PIO, Farm Bureau, Farm Advisors, and other organizations that are uh, connected with Josh's office. Um, and then the, the recommended change to 15.48.070 under exemptions D um, that you have in front of you is, is uh, it's on page 39 of your board packet, but that is to clarify that retaining walls four feet or less in height are exempt from getting a grading permit. Um, and that copy was provided to you and to the public. Um, so with that, the action requested is to introduce and waive the oral reading of an ordinance as modified, amending Chapter 15, Article 15.48 of the Placer County Code titled Grading, Erosion, and Sediment Control. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. I just want to disclose that I am a member of the uh, lengthy named uh, subwatership group that 
Rebecca uh, mentioned that uh, I irrigate and am a member of that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, is there any public comment on this item? Hi, Mike Karabedian. Um, first of all, not to comment at all on the substance of agriculture, but to call it bona fide. I just think it's a mistake to name anything bona fide something, like bona fide agriculture, because agriculture has all kinds of things and all that are bona fide. I mean, whether it's raised beds that can feed many families or, anyway, please change the name so, so you aren't implying that everything else is not bona fide agriculture. That's, that's just a, a comment about naming and not, not at all about substance. And on the question of um, uh, grading for uh, the foundations, uh, what's the language here? Um, grading directly below a structure. I assume that that's a bit misleading because some, so what I see in the landscape is um, some places where there are lots of vernal pools, which means they have hard pan underneath, are not doing what they should do, as, as I see it. Maybe they just haven't gotten to it yet, and maybe I can be proven wrong that the county does make sure if there's underlying uh, hard pan, it is, it is broken and, and isn't going to affect the housing. But um, so I guess part of the question is, you know, how, how far below a structure is involved and is the engineering that's critical to properly uh, have foundations for the housing is taken care of. I just assume as Public Works is, is going into that. But you know, there, there's at least one, one developer who has had multiple problems with the housing, uh, housing problems and failures. It's only one I've heard of and I haven't followed that case, but obviously I assume the county is aware of that example and knows how to avoid those problems if they are due to underlying um, hard pan or other drainage issues that aren't properly taken care of. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garabedian. Are there other public comments on this item? Okay, would staff like to um, respond to any comments that were raised on the title of bona fide council? <laughs> nope, okay. Okay, with that, um, then uh, the action requested is on the board except as amended based on what we have handed out. So uh, would somebody like to make that motion? Uh, Supervisor Holmes and Wygant, and all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. We'll move on to department item number six on our agenda, health and human services, access to technology program agreements. I believe Amy is online. Good morning, yes. Amy. Good morning, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. Um, and I, I too would like to congratulate and welcome Jane in your new role. I'm Amy Ellis. I'm the director of the adult system of care with three action items for your board's consideration today. The first, to adopt a resolution approving the Intergovernmental Agreement, AT-2223-31, with the State of California Department of Aging for the Access to Technology Program Initial Revenue Agreement in the amount of $648,891 from October 1st, 2022, through December 31st, 2024, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments, not to exceed an additional $64,889, consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and County Council concurrence. The second, to approve an agreement with Agency on Aging Area 4 in the amount of $648,891 for the Access to Technology Program, from October 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2023, with the option to extend the term an additional year and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $64,889, consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And last, to approve a fiscal year 22-23 budget amendment, AM-00739, for the adult system of care in the amount of $389,335.
So this contract will allow uh, Placer County to provide services under the Access to Technology program and receive state reimbursement for connecting eligible older adults and people with disabilities to technology in Placer County. These funds will be utilized in a contract with a, with a community-based provider who will be delivering the access to technology services that include purchase and provision of technology, developing or arranging education and training for older adults and adults with disabilities on the use of that technology, conduct, conducting outreach about the program and administration of the program. And basically, this is new grant funds that really want to get more accessibility for older adults and people with disabilities. So it can purchase the items, it can help them use them, it can, and it's intended to really help them stay connected with others and improve their quality of life. So agency on a, a, a area four currently already does similar work to assist seniors in the Placer County with their technology needs. So this program will just um, increase the numbers that they can serve and the ways that they can serve these individuals. So the total revenue uh, being received and the contract for services are each $648,891. And a, bu a budget amendment is increased to be, able to, um, to be able to enact all of these things I just described, but there is no impact to general fund and any questions that you might have. Thank you, Amy. Supervisor Gore. Yes, thanks, Amy. Question for you. So this contract with Area Aging, Area Four on Aging, terrific. I think this is so needed, right? We, this county has so many seniors in our communities that helping them get access to to technology is wonderful. How do we um, how do we work with them to make sure we can help inform our residents about these um, available funds, these services? Because I think that that would be really important. We've we all have another way to do outreach, probably even more so than this, this nonprofit. Yeah, um, I think that we we are planning to work with them, work with county PIO uh, to get the word out because we actually think that this is a large amount of money, and so the accessibility will be great because it's a pretty short time frame in which the funds need to be spent. So we want the word out. We want people to tell to tell eligible individuals about this. So we'll we will use um, social media, and we'd be happy to use your newsletters or any other means that this board would like us to use in order to get the word out about this great new program. That would be great. Thank you, Amy. I would. I think we all would appreciate having the opportunity to let our residents know. Supervisor Holmes. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Uh, would 211 be an option as far as getting that information out? Yeah, we'll definitely ensure that 211's aware of this and can get individuals who, um, you know, seem like they might have needs or bring, you know, to be able to get them over to this area for aging for help. Okay, good. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members? Then I'll look to the public for any comment. So uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about the response I got when the one time, rec the recent meeting, I attempted online to participate. Uh, I, I was recognized one time and I called. This was using the phone only. I obviously have no problem with the, uh, the other methods. And, uh, and I was told to unmute. Well, I had no idea how to unmute myself, and I lost it. I went off and on and off and on. And then it, I tried again later, and it was explained to me that you have no responsibility to explain to the public how to participate. And, that's, and I was told that some IT would call me and explain IT now. So I called IT, and there may be 80, I think there are 80 or more IT people, but nobody answered the phone. Uh, anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Well, I don't know how that's relevant to this item, but yeah. I do know that our um, Megan Wood would like to respond to this, maybe, and clarify the situation. Yes. So when you click on the unmute button on Zoom when you're on the phone, Zoom gives you the instructions. and what we explained to you was that while we would be happy to outside of a meeting walk you through how to do it we cannot walk through in a board meeting with everyone the uh, you know ways in which to utilize zoom and i know that it did reach out and i don't believe that you had answered and a message was left so i'm happy to follow up on that 
but we did we did attempt to after that board meeting connect with you coming in I don't have visual when I did that and, and I think what you're misunderstanding there is that it is still a zoom Function. function but when I'm on zoom you click something and you get it but there's nothing zoom has an odd it has a telephone function with it as well. I guess I'll be hearing from you yes thank you thank you for your comments any other public comments on this item I see none. okay then um, I would entertain a motion we can do these three actions with one motion Supervisor Gore and Holmes, this is a roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Then we will move to item 6B. Um, this is uh, Proposition 47 Agreements with Granite Wellness Centers and Nancy Callahan, PhD. I believe there's an amendment on this, Amy, uh, Amy and you're going to cover this item? Yes, I will. At the end, I'm going to go ahead and give the background first this time, and then um, I'll do the amendment after the action items at the end. Um, so good morning again, uh, Chair Gustafson, and I'm Amy Ellis, for the record, with the Adult System of Care. Um, so in November of 2014, California's voters approved Proposition 14, I mean, Proposition 47, the Safe Neighborhoods and School Act. This was to ensure that prison spending is focused on violent and serious offenses to maximize alternatives to non-serious, non-violent crimes and to invest the savings that, that <clears throat> occurred into prevention and support programs within the community. So uh, counties were then given the opportunity to apply through a competitive grant for these savings funds um, that resulted and Placer County has um, submitted applications and received every round of funding. So uh, we initially created a Prop 47 action team that was a combination of HHS, um, probation, and Granite Wellness Centers to provide um, wraparound services to probationers. Um, in a, and it was very successful. We served about 105 individuals and over 90% of those participants avoided subsequent arrest and or legal system involvement. Um, and then in March of 2019, we submitted a second proposal to continue and expand the, the Prop 47. So we, we did that and were able to then serve over 200 residents and um, expand the age ranges from 17 to 65 in that second round. And in April of 2022, Placer County Health and Human Services in, in collaboration with probation and the district attorney's office this time, we applied for another round of prop, this would be cohort three, and we were successful yet again, and we were, were this time we'll be receiving $6 million to continue our action team services and to expand as well. So Granite Wellness Centers has been operating um, the Proposition 47 action team since its inception and will continue to provide these services with this third round. They have built the infrastructure needed to seamlessly continue the program and built effective partnerships with probation and other community-based organizations to support the participants. Nancy Callahan has been the consultant and evaluator um, on this project from the, the beginning as well and will continue in that role. Services will be uh, continue to be tailored to each participant's needs. They'll be culturally competent, trauma-informed, with an overall goal to divert individuals and prevent recidivism from the criminal justice system and to promote safe and healthy communities. So the total cost of these contracts is $4.5 million, and the funding for these contracts is available uh, in the fiscal year 22-23 budget, and there is no uh, um, impact to general fund. So the action items for your consideration today are to first to approve an agreement with Granite Wellness Centers for Proposition 47 Action Team Services from February 16th, 2023 through February 15th, 2026 in an amount not to exceed $4.2 million and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. The second to approve an agreement with Nancy Callahan, PhD, doing business as IDEA Consulting for Proposition 47 Action Team Evaluation Services in an, in an amount not to exceed 300,000 for a period of February 16th, 2023 through June 1st, 2026 
and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $30,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. The change to these action items from, from what I just read is that uh, based on recent direction from the state after the agenda packet was finalized, um, I request the board to move and amend the first and second action items listed on the agenda to include January 1st, 2023 start date instead of the listed start date as February 16th, 2023. So we would need that change to January 1 for both items, um, action item one and two, please. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Supervisor Holmes. Oh, I just want to point out how fortunate we are in Placer County to have the collaboration with Health and Human Services, with our probation department and the uh, district attorney's office. Uh, it really uh, makes me proud that we all work together. And there's some very positive results of this collaboration. And I just want to thank Amy and the, those involved in the program uh, for, for making this happen. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Any other board member comments or questions? Not seeing any. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? I see that, Chair. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. I'd entertain a motion with the actions requested and the amendment to January 1st on both items. Second. Supervisor Holmes and Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Now we'll move on to item seven uh, on our, under our department items. Uh, human resources, the Tahoe branch assignment premiums. Good morning, Nicole. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm Nicole Lopez, the Assistant Director of Human Resources. Before you today is a request for your board to retroactively remove the residency requirement for the Tahoe branch assignment premium pay by adopting resolutions addressing all employee labor groups, approving side letters of memorandum of understandings, and through introduction of a codified ordinance to amend chapter three of the county code. The Tahoe branch assignment premium pay is designed to recruit and retain employees for critical services in the remote eastern portion of Placer County. This request is consistent with actions previously taken by your board to ensure regulatory compliance within the CalPERS special compensation requirements, which includes providing equal availability to all members of a group or class in order for the pay to be factored into the employee's calculation of retirement benefits. Currently, all employees assigned to work in Tahoe work location are receiving the premium pay, which is a budget ex expense and included in the applicable department appropriations. Any request to retroactively provide this benefit, which we believe is less than a handful, would be addressed through the county's overpayment and underpayment of wages and benefit premiums policy within the adopted fiscal year 2022-23 budget. I'm available to answer any questions that you may have on this item. Thank you. Are there questions? I don't have any. Um, are there, is there any public comment on this item? Okay, no public comment. Then these do require individual, nine individual motions. Okay, I don't know. We might have questions now. No. <laughs> so I will entertain a motion on number one. Second. Jones and Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Item number two. Second. Jones and Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Item number three. Thank you, Jones and Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Any abstentions? Oh, any <laughs> opposition? <laughs> any abstention? Okay. Number four. Second. Jones and Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number five. 
I'm not going to keep repeating their names. It sounds like they're on a roll. <laughs> All those in favor? Any, abs uh, op any opposed? Any abstentions? Oh, you're so funny. Yeah, easy. Item number six. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Item number seven. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Item number eight. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And item number nine. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Yeah, individual motions. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on then to item 7B, establishment of salary grades for classifications represented by the Placer County Deputy District Attorneys Association. And Suzanne Holloway is here. Good morning, members of the board, Madam Chair. Congratulations to Jane. This one's going to be a little easier than the last one. <laughs> Um, on November 8th, 2022, your board approved the establishment of a new um, bargaining unit, the Placer County Deputy District Attorneys Association. The item before you today is just to establish separate salary ranges for those classifications that are included in that new bargaining unit. Those include child support attorneys, one through senior, as well as deputy district attorneys, one through senior. Um, you have a attachment that lists the different salary ranges. There's no differences in the pay it's just uh, we had to retitle those and that will be published on the schedule of classifications and compensation ordinance and i'm happy to answer any questions you might have are there any questions i don't see any here are there any public comments on this item i'm not seeing any here or on zoom and so i'd entertain a motion I heard Supervisor Jones first. Will you second that, Mr. Holmes? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Item number eight on today's agenda, Public Works Parking Ordinance Update, Various County Roadways. Good morning, Phil. It's still morning. Yay. Still morning. It is. We've done a lot already. It's good. I'm bringing up the rear with almost the last item. I almost the last <laughs> item. Morning, Madam Chair and board members. I'm here today to uh, action request today is to introduce an ordinance and waive oral reading to amend provisions of Chapter 10, Article 10.12, Section 10.12.120 of the Placer County Code regarding parking restrictions on various county roadways. So the California Vehicle Code allows local agencies gives the local agencies the authority to prohibit or restrict the stopping, parking, or standing of vehicles on or along public roadways by ordinance. We do this periodically, uh, you know, every couple of years. Uh, we usually get uh, requests by the public as well to do this. Uh, so we determine the need for additions to or modifications or of existing parking restrictions on county roadways, which may result in modification to our current code. The proposed ordinance reflects the parking restrictions that are currently defined by both signs and markings on various county roads and includes proposed new parking restrictions on county roads. I'll just touch on a few of the major ones that we're proposing. Auburn Folsom Road, we've been getting reports from the Homeowners Association out there for Los Lagos that uh, there's a lot of parties that go on, that go on big parties where people are parking alongside the roadway. Um, we want to restrict that, and so along with the Los Lagos Homeowners Association, we want to do that to restrict parking along there and to keep people from crossing the street as well. Crother Road, adjacent to the Live Oak Waldorf School and portions of Crother Hills Road. The proposed restrictions were requested by Live Oak Waldorf School. Uh, the school conducts many events and activities throughout the year and is required to post no parking signs along the nearby roadways for each event. Um, the proposed parking restrictions are consistent with the school's current parking restrictions for events. And also, if you're familiar with Crother Road, it's a pretty narrow road. There's no shoulders out there, so if people park out there, they're sticking out into the travel lane. Forest Hill Road, during the summertime, um, Upper Lake Clementine, they get a lot of traffic in there. Uh, a lot of that traffic likes to spill out on the Forest Hill Road. High speed, curvilinear road, not much sight distance out there. 
So we want to uh, restrict parking along certain areas out there. And lastly, North Star Drive. Uh, happily, we uh, were able to put Class II bike lanes along the whole stretch of roadway out there. So we want to restrict no parking on both sides of the road, the full, the full length of road. There are other areas as depicted by the ordinance. Uh, notifications were sent out by letters to property owners affected by these parking restrictions. Um, there was one concern brought to us by the WellQuest Senior Living Facility. Uh, we did have Sierra College on the list, but we pulled that based upon, uh, they told us that they need a little bit of extra parking during like Mother's Day, holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas. So we will revisit that in the future. I promise you, Supervisor Jones. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, subsequent board action will be needed to officially adopt the ordinance. This will happen a week from today. Take any questions. Great. Are there questions? Supervisor mm -hmm. Jones. Yes, thank you for all of that. Appreciate it. Um, the one I was curious about is Douglas Boulevard. It's just before the Forest Hill Road. It's, uh, it's a, just a short distance, apparently, on the north side of the road. Where in particular is that? That's uh, just west of Auburn Folsom Road near the uh, shopping center there. There's people that park their cars there for for sale signs there as well, so it's not not conducive to safety. Okay. Okay, that's what I thought it was. Good. Thank you so much for, for responding to my yeah. community. You're welcome. I don't see any other questions from the board. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. Do I and Supervisor Wygant, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'm not seeing any. Thanks so much, Phil. And our final item today uh, is brought to us by the Clerk of the Board, uh, Mountain Counties Water Resources Association, and this is a committee assignment um, that is coming out of our normal cycle, just like we did with Supervisor Gore last meeting or meeting before, yes. we are That's handling correct. it this way. So. This one is, is slightly different, Chair, as um, we are recommending that Supervisor Holmes, uh, we're authorizing our now CEO, Jane Christensen, to nominate Supervisor Holmes to serve as an elected representative to Mountain County's Board of Directors. So their Board of Directors serves at an election of their executive members. So their executive members would vote and determine who those will be. Supervisor Holmes has been serving on that for the last four years and has expressed interest in continuing to serve. The election will take place, uh, nominations are due tomorrow and I believe the election is supposed to take place on the 9th. Great, any questions, any comments, any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any, so I'd entertain a motion. Thank you, Supervisor Jones and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Well, it is 1132, and we're ready to adjourn to closed session, County Council. The board will now adjourn to closed session to consider five items of existing litigation, one item of initiation of litigation, and three items of potential exposure to litigation. Okay, the board has returned from closed session. The County Council will give the report. The board met in closed session to consider the following. Under existing litigation, City of Lincoln versus County of Placer, the board heard a report and provided direction. In the matter of County of Placer versus Marisaurus Bergen et al., the county heard a report, no action requested or taken. In the matter of In Re James Rashid, the board heard a report and authorized settlement. In the matter of In Re Ryan Owens, the board heard a report and authorized settlement. In the matter of Union Pacific Railroad Company versus Alameda County et al., the board heard a report and authorized settlement. Under anticipated litigation, one potential case under initiation of litigation, the board heard a report and provided direction. Under potential exposure to litigation in the first potential case, the board heard a report and provided direction. Second potential case, the board heard a report and provided direction. In the third potential case, the board heard a report and provided direction. This concludes the report out of closed session. Thank you, Karen, and we stand adjourned. <laughs>